Thank you very much, uh, Melinda. And ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor to, to be invited here and such a pleasure to look from this podium out at such a magnificent gathering. Thank you so much for allowing me uh, to be a part of this. And Melinda, thank you again for your um, introduction. Uh, Premier Palaszczuk, thank you uh, for your outstanding leadership on uh, these incredibly challenging economic uh, and energy and environmental issues that are all intertwined, uh, taking um, so many different uh, acts of leadership to move Queensland forward. It's really quite impressive, and I'll return to that theme in just a moment, but I want to acknowledge uh, your treasurer and deputy premier, Jackie Trad. Uh, Minister Enoch, Minister Miles, I'm going to get into trouble by not acknowledging all of the distinguished ministers and elected uh, officials, Lily D'Ambrosio. I'm, I'm reminded that there are ministers and treasurers from other parts of uh, Australia here and business leaders and distinguished guests of all kinds. I, I have been here for, this is the third day, uh, training a group of almost 800 new uh, leaders on the issue of climate. Uh, the President and CEO of the Climate Reality Project, Ken Berlin, is here, and one of our board members, Don Henry, who also works with the uh, University of Melbourne Sustainability um, Institute, uh, is a colleague and partner. Uh, Melinda, I was listening to your introduction, and I couldn't help but recall um, my experiences as Vice President, I was asked on one of the uh, late night television shows in the U.S. back when I was Vice President, what is the best thing about being Vice President? And I said, well, there's the great seal of the Vice President of the United States, and if you close one eye and turn your head just right, it says, President of the United States <laughs> of America. <laughs> In any case, I am uh, enormously impressed, Premier, with what uh, has happened here in Queensland under your leadership. Uh, this is the place where the future is unfolding. And yes, of course, there are all kinds of issues. There are always are, and when there is a transition from one age to another, it's never easy to navigate such a transition. But when you look at the incredible progress for renewable energy development here in Queensland, electric vehicles, the fact that uh, here in Brisbane you're manufacturing one of the high-value uh, products that's central to these, this uh, transition to electric vehicles. By the way, you know, India just uh, announced uh, recently that it is going to require the legal phasing out of all internal combustion engines by 2030. Uh, whether they follow through on that or not remains to be seen, but there are many, many uh, jurisdictions around the world, many countries and subnational governments that are now prospectively banning internal combustion engines. Even in uh, Germany, the birthplace of diesel, their largest cities, many of them are banning diesels from uh, inside their cities. And auto manufacturers virtually, I, I actually don't know of an exception. I think now every large automobile manufacturer in the world is shifting to electric vehicles. Within less than two years, the cost of the, dry, the powertrain, the central most expensive part of a vehicle, for electric vehicles is going to fall lower in price than the powertrain for internal combustion engines. It is really um, an amount of change that is, I think, quite literally unprecedented. You can talk about renewable energy and electric vehicles and Battery storage, Australia now has the largest battery in the world. My country, uh, 
The state of Florida, which has um, <clears throat> one thing in common with Queensland, by the way, Florida and Queensland both have the nickname the Sunshine State. Um, up until recently, it's been illegal to uh, lease a solar panel in Florida because the coal burning utility uh, controls the government. But how does that work? Never mind. Um, the, uh, one of the, ut the largest utility there just announced it is closing uh, two huge natural gas burning electric uh, generating plants, replacing it with a uh, solar farm coupled with a new battery that's four times larger than the world record holding battery in South Australia. Uh, LEDs within three years are going to account for 95% of all of the new lighting purchased in the world. Isn't that astonishing how quickly that transition is taking place? Within five years, more than 50% of all of the buses in the world are going to be electric buses. Um, efficiency improvements, we've seen the decoupling of GDP and electricity or, and energy consumption. Um, we are seeing in, in, in some, if you take all of these and other related trends and put them together, it's clear that w our world is now in the early stages of a sustainability revolution based in part on new digital capacities and tools like machine learning and artificial intelligence and the internet of things. And it's empowering the executive teams of many businesses and industries to, to manage uh, electrons and, and molecules uh, and atoms uh, and genes, by the way, um, with the same skill and precision that the information technology companies have demonstrated in managing bits of information. This sustainability revolution apparently has the magnitude of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. It is literally unprecedented. One quick example, uh, Google, uh, I actually, when I went into the business world after leaving uh, the White House um, involuntarily in 2001, <laughs> you think that's funny, do you? <laughs> I mean, my attitude is you win some, you lose some, and then there's that little known third category. In any case, <laughs> when I went in, I, uh, I, I, w I was invited to come and work with Google, and I, I was happy about that later on. Uh, at the time, too. But uh, just to give you one example, they have used uh, their new artificial intelligence company, DeepMind, uh, to reduce energy consumption in their server farms. Google has the largest server farms of any company in the world. So they also have a lot of data about how those server farms have been operating for many years, deep structured data, so they have an advantage there. But they applied artificial intelligence. This story is not well known, but here is the result. With no new hardware, simply the application of artificial intelligence, they have reduced the energy consumption of those server farms by 60% with more intelligent management of the, the electrons and the BTUs. And there are examples across so many sectors of business and industry where inefficiencies that we've always accepted and taken for granted can now be identified precisely and pushed away. So energy demand is being reduced quite significantly, even as the new sources of energy in solar and wind are rising uh, to be a part 
of this sustainability revolution. The exponential growth of renewable energy at the global level is really at a tipping point. We had a wonderful discussion earlier uh, in, a, in a smaller group about the economics of the sustainability revolution. I, I was uh, the, your, the deputy uh, head of your federal bank was uh, an assistant to an economist that was a great friend of mine in the U.S., uh, Rudy Dornbush, and he had a saying. He used to say, things take longer to happen than you think they will, but then they happen much faster than you thought they could. That's what we're seeing now. And Queensland, thanks in no small measure to the leadership of your premier and uh, the group of ministers and uh, leaders who are part of her team, are positioning and have made Queensland one of the real leaders in this revolution. So I really do congratulate you, but you ain't seen nothing yet. This revolution is still growing in speed and magnitude. And of course, the dangers that we face from the climate crisis are also growing. Uh, I often try to choose my words carefully so as not to uh, push people toward so much uh, apprehension and fear, really, uh, about what lies ahead that uh, it induces paralysis. But that's not who we are as human beings. We have the capacity to see dangers when they're obvious and, and react and protect our civilization, our children, our grandchildren. But uh, worldwide, uh, emissions are going back up again. You know, the sky is not a vast and limitless expanse. It's a very thin shell surrounding the planet. If you could drive uh, an automobile at uh, highway speed straight up in the air, you'd get to the top of the sky in five or 10 minutes, to the layer where you can't breathe anymore and where the greenhouse gases accumulate. And we're, we're, t we're using that thin shell of atmosphere as an open sewer for the gaseous waste of our civ civilization. And we're spewing uh, a 110 million tons every day of this gaseous waste into that thin shell of atmosphere. And it stays there for a thousand years on average. And the cumulative amount that's there today, to which we're continually adding, but the amount today now traps as much extra heat energy from the sun as would be released by five 100,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. Hard to imagine, but that's the reality that we're facing. And it's boiling the oceans. That's a metaphorical use of the word boiling. It's raising the temperature of the oceans so significantly because 93% of all that energy is going into the oceans, and with respect to Las Vegas, what happens in the ocean doesn't stay in the oceans. It, it, it's causing the release of so much additional water vapor to start the water cycle that it feeds these atmospheric rivers. The Brazilian scientists who first began to focus on this called them flying rivers. The average atmospheric river has 25 times as much moisture as the Mississippi River, the largest river in my country. And when uh, that comes over the land and encounters the conditions that release a downpour, what you get is not a gentle rain. You get a rain bomb, as the scientists now refer to them. You've had some this year in uh, Queensland, in Townsville, for example. 500,000 cattle drowned. And the other examples are quite 
numerous. In Houston, Texas, we had one and a half meters of rain. Largest rainfall in the history of my country. And you can go around the world in India and in China and South America and Africa. It's rained in Antarctica. It doesn't happen very often. They don't know the history there, but they don't think it's rained until recently there, but now it does. Last year was the hottest year in the history of Antarctica. And both in Antarctica and in Greenland, this extra heat energy is melting the ice. Of course, people know this. And that is beginning to speed up the sea level increases. And there are places in Australia, neighborhoods in Sydney, for example, where the sea level rise is already causing damage. And there are insurance companies who are warning homeowners and business owners that their ability to buy insurance in these coastal areas is going to disappear in some, in some of those areas. We had a panel of scientists yesterday who were asked by, in questions from the audience of these 800 from around uh, Australia and the Pacific Island nations, uh, tell us what uh, could happen if we don't rein in these emissions. H how bad could it be? What would the sea level increase be? Well, it wouldn't happen right away. It wouldn't it happen even. We could have a meter and a half uh, to two meters in this century. The scientists are not yet willing to say that's the most likely outcome, but if it went ahead unchecked into the next century, how much sea level rise? 100 meters. Do we owe any obligation at all to the generations that follow us? Do we wish them, if they have schools for their children, to read in their lesson plans those men and women who lived in the first decades of the 20th century did not give a damn about us. And they let this happen. I'm sorry to get worked up. I'm going to move to the good news here in a minute. And the good news is abundant. If we did not act, the consequences that would ensue are unthinkable. They're unacceptable. Who are we as human beings? A scientist once said to me, what we're engaged in, uh, Al, is an experiment to see if the combination of an opposable thumb and a neocortex is a viable combination on this planet. I refuse to believe that we as human beings are destined to preside over our own destruction. I choose to believe, and I do believe in my heart, that we have the capacity to rise above our limitations and to choose a course that saves our future. And I see that happening here in Queensland with the choice in favor of this sustainability revolution, with renewable energy. I know there's a lot of coal. By the way, just uh, one hour before this luncheon started back in the United States where I live. My friend Michael Bloomberg just announced that he's going to spend $500 million to completely close all of the remaining coal plants uh, in the United States of America. And by the way, in India, uh, which in some important ways ha is connected in this region to Australia and others, they're building 225 gigawatts of solar, and the price of electricity from solar is now 25% lower than the electricity from coal, and some coal mines in India are shutting down. We have in the United States some very expensive holes in the ground that taxpayers and electricity ratepayers are still paying for and getting nothing in return. It's a difficult transition period. But ladies and gentlemen, the opportunities are fantastic. The Bureau of Labor Statistics in my country just had another report, consistent with last year's report. The fastest growing job in the United States of America is solar installer. That job is growing six times faster than average job growth. 
Second fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. The jobs in retrofitting buildings, in improving efficiency, in reducing energy demand, in, create, in installing LEDs, these jobs are the ones that are growing. And by the way, the young people in my country and in Australia are demanding a better future. More than 100,000 Australian students joined the school strike movement. You think they're slowing down? Not a chance. Businesses in hiring the brightest and best young women and men coming out of universities are hearing young people say, OK, what are your values? If I go to work for you, I want a good wage for sure, but I want to be able to tell my mates, my peers, my family, my friends, that I'm part of something more than just making money. And what I'm hearing from the business community in Australia, not always in public, often in public, but even more in private, is that they get it. You get it. Now, yeah, there's some laggards for sure. There always are. But the history of this period will record that the change became unstoppable and that Queensland helped to lead the way. There are only three questions left about the climate crisis. Do we really have to change? Must we change? The evidence is pretty clear. I've mentioned many of the examples. I didn't mention drought. I didn't mention the Great Barrier Reef yet. I didn't mention the threat to the productivity of the oceans or many of the other reasons why we have to change. Second question, can we change? Equally important. Sometimes in life you have to change, but you don't have the ability. Boy, that's a formula for depression. But that's not the case we are facing now. We can change. We have the tools available to us. And Queensland is demonstrating it and moving forward to implement them. The third and final question, the most important, is will we change? Sometimes in life, we have to change, we can change, and then we don't change. I don't think that's the situation we're facing either. But you know what? The jury is still out. Will the rest of the world follow Queensland's leadership? Will Australia seize the opportunity to become, as many have said, is now in its destiny, the renewable energy superpower of the 21st century. You have the most sun-blessed nation of any nation in the world, 195 nations. You rank how much sunlight they get, how much solar energy potential they get. Australia's number one on the list. You're not number one on wind, but you're in the top five. You are already producing a lot of renewable energy, but you could make this your future. You could build a nationwide grid. You could export renewable electricity by long distance, high capacity DC cables to Indonesia, to Singapore, to other nations hungry for non-polluting energy, energy that does not contribute to the destruction of humanity's future. You could use zero marginal cost electricity, which you, are, you already have for several hours of many days. You could have it in abundance and use it to operate the high school chemistry equations that convert water into hydrogen and oxygen and use hydrogen a a a as a, a conveyor and storage medium for energy and export it to the rest of the world, starting with Japan. And your premier here in Queensland has already engaged in discussions with the government of Japan about how to make that happen. But the nation has to make a decision. Will you educate the engineers you need? Will you build the infrastructure that's necessary? 
Will you avoid the opportunity cost of still going after dinosaur projects of the past? That's all I'm going to say. I'm encouraged. I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. I truly believe that Queensland is showing the way to humanity's bright and hopeful future. I said the jury is still out, but I am optimistic. And I want to congratulate your premier, your government, your business community, your investor community, and all of you who are a part of this transition. And I know they're skeptics. But I'll close by saying this, if anybody doubts for one moment that we as human beings have the will to change, just remember that the will to change is itself a renewable resource. Thank you very much.